All right, we'd like to get this uh, meeting of community infrastructure services started and welcome everybody back from a small summer break. Uh, we have seven consent items, uh, if somebody would like to move those. Moved by Councillor Ioannidis. Are there, um, I want to make note on number one, it isn't written on the agenda, the noise exemption and park closing exemption for Bright Up Park camping events, that that is coming to special council later today, so I just want to make note of that now. Um, and that number three, the barrack condos, that if we want to, um, there's a chance that some of the concrete pours are going to happen prior to our council meeting. So if we wanted to, we can let it go tell council or we could waive notice during special council in order to uh, move that noise exemption forward. With that, uh, Councillor Marsh. I want to pull a few items out of sure. consent. Uh, maybe, well, for myself, I'm interested in number one and... Uh, number, sorry, number uh, six. And where's the um, cross crossing guard? That's not until the That's, discussion. Okay, thanks. So, yep. Yeah. Okay, and Councillor Fernandez? Yeah, I just wanted number um, five and six to be pulled out. Okay, I don't see any further. Councillor Grizzola? I'm interested in four, five, and seven. Just a quick question. Four, five, and seven. Okay, so with that, we have two and three that we can deal with. Uh, so it's been moved. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. All right, we'll start with number one, Councillor Marsh. I have no problem with this uh, uh, recommendation, and I, I think it's it's terrific. I just want to make note that for the minutes that we need to make sure the uh, neighborhood association is named properly. It's the Mount Hope Bright Up Park Neighborhood Association, and also uh, it, would, it would be better if we had clear language on exactly the hours. Uh, I, th I understand the intention, but it just is a little unclear the way it's worded in the recommendation. So I know that it's from 3 p.m. on the Saturday to noon on the Sunday. Okay, thanks for that. And again, just a reminder that that will be coming to special council later this afternoon. Uh, so that is number one. Any, any other questions on number one? Those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. All right, we will now go to number four, which is the zoning bylaw amendment for 114 to 120 Victoria Street South. Councillor Grizzola? Now, I'm just curious as to why it's here and not at planning. What, what is it that we're exactly doing with? What is it, what's the recommendation? Just to remove the holding provision. But uh, Justin wants to add something? Through the committee chair, that's correct. It's to remove the holding provision to allow residential to be um, constructed on site. Uh, so there was cleanup that was associated with it. The MOE CC has um, approved the residential allowance for the site. So, so there's no issue with the neighborhood or anything like that? Everything's fine? That's correct. Yeah, okay. All right, that's fine. Thanks. Okay. Uh, is there any other questions on, on number four? No. Um, so all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. All right. Number five, the Community Energy Investment Strategy Implementation. Councillor Fernandez. Yes, thank you. Um, I know that this was uh, something that was strongly supported by Council, but I, in reading the report, um, I w had a couple questions when it talked about the three components from the city of Kitchener, which is the city of Kitchener, the Kitchener Utilities, and Kitchener Wilmot Hydro. Um, because in the financial implications, it talks about $20,000 for each of the three years, including Kitchener Utilities. Does that include Kitchener Wilmot Hydro as well as their, their contribution is $20,000, or is it Kitchener Utilities and the city of Kitchener is $20,000 and Kitchener Wilmot Hydro is another $20,000? Mr. Reedman? Through the chair. Um, so 
Uh, because the city of Kitchener owns Kitchener Utilities within house, um, we'd worked out an agreement with the rest of the agencies um, that our commitment would be $20,000. Waterloo and Cambridge's commitment is $15,000, so ours is slightly higher, recognizing we also have a gas utility. KW Hydro's contribution is $21,000 in addition to what we're paying. Okay, because we, we're shareholders in that as well. So I, I, really then what we're going to be putting towards this is $41,000? Through the chairs of their arm's length organization, we are shareholders in that, but they are an arm's length organization, so that was separated out. Um, uh, Waterloo North Hydro is sharing contributions. So they would have a similar arrangement in, in the other municipalities as well. Okay. So I, I, I think it's, it's important for us to look at ways to improve our um, energy consumption and, and how to transition to low carbon, like all of the goals of the strategy, I think all of those are important. But in reading further into the report, I'm reading that we're talking about a community energy manager. So where would they be housed? Um, who would be have the oversight to what they're doing? And in reading the report, I'm thinking that I'm understanding that they're going to be writing grant proposals. So that's kind of three questions, but if you can respond to those. Sure. Uh, through the chair. Um, so there's a governance committee that has been established, mm -hmm. which includes a representative from each of the 21 agencies that are participating in this. Um, so they set the work plan and, and uh, the priorities moving forward. Those all come from the report that was endorsed but unanimously by this council and other councils in the region um, in February of this year. Mm -hmm. um, so they would be doing work on behalf of all the partner agencies and there would be some in-kind contributions from our organizations as well since this is a shared accountability to implement the energy strategy. Um, but this person would be the main coordinator and the key person that's um, coordinating the approach, doing some of the legwork and then also writing some of the grants. Okay, so the governance committee would be the committee that would hire this person. They would have oversight and responsibilities to the governance committee. Is that correct? Through the chair, so they would establish, so, so the governance committee has established the approximate salary bands, um, the job description. Um, the proposal is to house the employee at GRE office, so that's the Grand River Energy office, which is a subsidiary of KW Hydro. Um, so they would be technically an employee of that area, but would report to the governance committee. Okay. And how will we, uh, who will set their, their goals and their responsibilities so that they, um, I mean, we want to know what the deliverables will be. Will we be checking, have a check-in once a year, once every two years? How will we understand what the deliverables are and where those, um, where they land in a year's time? So through the chair, um, so the, the main deliverables are what were included in the, the community energy investment strategy. Mm -hmm. um, the, the governance committee has looked at prioritizing those, so it's a, a committee decision on what the priorities are for the first year. Um, and then there will be annual reporting back to the governance committee and then summary reports to different councils on where we're at. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councillor Kozola? Yes, yeah, some of my questions have been answered, but when, when, was the, uh, when was this approved by council? Could you just give me the dating? I need to go back and review what exactly was approved. It, it appears to me we're setting up a whole new agency here with a quarter of a million dollars a year budget. Is that correct? So through the chair, this was approved on, from our council on February 5th, 2018. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, uh, you. You keep mentioning there are 21 uh, shareholders or participants in this? Sorry, I was, I'm incorrect in my numbers. That's 12, actually. So it's the region of Waterloo, cities of Kitchener, Cambridge, Waterloo, townships of Woolwich, Wilmont, and Wellesley, North Dumfries, and then the utilities, Union Gas, Waterloo North Hydro, KW Hydro, and Energy Plus. What is Energy Plus? That is Cambridge Hydro. Oh, it's an option. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. And it, but, but it's a whole new structure. And uh, the, if I go back to that February the fifth report, will it give me all the answers that I'm looking for? 
through the chair. Um, so the report outlined the overall goals and objectives of the community energy investment strategy and also recommended um, reporting back on an overall governance structure. So this is part of that implementation. So, but we're basically setting up an agency or a, a corporation or something to, to get involved in this. I mean, we talk about starting out at 200,000 a year and it will go up from there, so th that's my only concern. But, uh, I, 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 I thought I understood what we were doing back in February, but I'm not clear. But that, that's fine. I need to go back and review it. Thank I think you. Uh, Brandon wanted to add something. Yeah, through the chair to supplement Justin's uh, responses, uh, I'm helping him out with the implementation of this and was part of the strategy when it was prepared. It is in the documentation. Uh, from that work in February as to a recommended approach. If you would take a comparable would be what we've done with the Community Climate Action Plan. So this isn't necessarily setting up an agency. This is having an actual dedicated resource and actual partners that are willing to fund it collaboratively so that we don't have to go it alone to actually work on the implementation actions of that strategy that all the regional and municip local municipal councils have adopted. Well, that, that's where I, I got a little confused because I, I knew we have this, com this action plan also in place and I'm wondering, are we getting into some duplication of efforts here or not? So, I mean, that's why I, I need to go back and do my homework. Yeah, and through the chair to address that, we've been very cognizant of that when the strategy was prepared and it was in that February report about what things the Community Climate Action Plan are doing and those actions. Where they're lacking is on this topic of energy. And that's why we didn't have the, to be honest, the utilities really engaged in that. They are very engaged in this piece because it's very focused on energy. And so we're, we're cognizant that there's no duplication, but it was a good model to create this position that is collaboratively funded. Uh, this is a little bit more structured, so there's formal governance of this, formal reporting, and the utilities are a lot more involved. Thank you. Councillor Marsh. My question is just, uh, is it enough? It doesn't seem like a lot of money, uh, and so I'm just trying to understand if the idea was to ask for this amount, thinking that it would be more palatable, or uh, but not necessarily enough, or is it sufficient for uh, achieving our goals from the action plan? Mr. Reedman? Through the chair, um, so the, the funding is to get a resource, a shared resource across all agencies to help coordinate the efforts. There will be additional work um, where staff will be providing input on the different components as they're implemented. Um, so likely most of that work will be covered through existing resources at the different organizations. Um, but this really is to have a coordinator and somebody who's really driving the program forward. Okay, thank you. Councillor Davey. Thank you. Just some clarity. I'm, I'm a big supporter. I'm just I'm not 100% clear on the, the funding. So KW Hydro is funding 20 or 21. Uh, the City of Kitchener is going to fund 20. Is uh, the Kitchener Utilities funding an additional 20 or is that combined? Through the chair, that's correct. KW Hydro is funding an additional $21,000 on top of our portion. Okay, so is this going to be, I, I realize it's referred to budget, so then it'll be more clarity then, but uh, is it possible this won't entirely be tax supported? Like, will kitchen utilities be funding some of that 20000 possibly? Through the chair, that is correct. So the, the strategy at this point in time is, uh, depending on the timing of hiring the FTE, um, Kitchener Utilities would pay our share for the remainder of this year and then um, the rest would be re referred to budget um, to identify the, our proportionate share in future years. Okay, very good. Okay, that's all the questions on this. Uh, it's been moved. All in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Uh, we'll now move on to the level two pedestrian crossover implementation for King Street East and Cameron Street. Councillor Marsh. Thank you. I'm very pleased to see this come forward. I do wonder, though, why it is that a level two pedestrian crossover is being recommended instead of a full stop light that would only be pedestrian activated, similar to the one on Weber at Wilhelm. I'm concerned because 
I know that <clears throat> at rush hour when uh, the primary uh, use will be uh, uh, <clears throat> students, I'm just concerned that uh, there will be uh, uh, conflicts between cars and, and pedestrians. And so, uh, what I want to know is, uh, A, why is this the recommended one? Uh, obviously, you've got the numbers, the warrants, but um, was, was safety not considered in uh, looking at potentially having a, a more robust form of a pedestrian-activated stop, stoplight? Mr. Cronkite? Through you, Madam Chair, we've worked uh, very collaboratively, collaboratively with the region on this initiative. Uh, to give you some perspective, when we start talking about mid-block pedestrian signals, which is the one that you're referring to, uh, the, it comes down to a warrant process. Uh, simple terms, this didn't meet the warrant for a mid-block uh, mid pedestrian signal, but the region does support the installation of this PXO. Uh, in terms of safety, that was considered. The one thing to keep in mind is that if we install this that we can always go back and revisit at a later date in terms of the warrant for mid-block pedestrian signal but at this time that that's just not warranted so this is right at an intersection king and cameron and so help me understand what you mean by mid-block in the terms in terms of the example that you provided it's a, it's a mid-block signal right one that would be activated so yellow like yellow green red that's only activated by pedestrian uh, in terms of full intersection, um, again, it wouldn't meet the requirement for a full traffic signal. Okay, so um, oh, can we can can I ask uh, for staff to come back with uh, an amount that it would be uh, uh, that that it would cost for us to put in the you're calling it the mid block full uh, stop signal? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, absolutely. The, to give you some perspective, the general cost, the level C estimate, would be in the neighborhood of eighty to one hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And then, on top of that, eighty to one hundred thousand dollars, we would have to earmark an additional five thousand dollars annually for maintenance and electricity. Mr. Reedman would like to jump in. Yeah, through the chair, if I could just um, add, um, the region would likely not support a full signal at this intersection, which um, would be a challenge. Um, so this is a new tool in the toolbox, which gives a right of way to pedestrians. It's got rapid flashing beacons, which are activated. And the Ontario traffic laws require a full stop until ev anybody clears that full intersection. So this is a new tool in the toolbox that's intended for this type of use. And this is the tool in the toolbox that we've already implemented at Victoria Park, is that correct? Correct. Le level two. And, and have we not heard of many uh, incidents where cars are still going through even though pedestrians are attempting to cross and so there's been some near misses, have, have there not? So, the, so because it is a new tool, there's a bit of a learning curve with the community as well. Um, if we were to put in a, a signal, an IPS signal here, it likely would not have stop controls for the, the Cameron Street access, so there would be no signal there th through that um, portion. Um, so it would provide sort of a similar level of benefit, but wouldn't meet the warrant requirement, if, that, if that's clear. That's not clear to me, but okay. I'll, maybe I'll, I'll continue offline. Thanks. Um, I, I'm, I'm just very concerned because, I, I mean, what is the cost of, of one uh, accident? It's, it's actually, I, I, I would hate to think um, that we're, we're just uh, doing this for cost. You're saying, I'm hearing that, res that the region is uh, potentially not going to support that or, or that wouldn't support it, but this is a city road at this intersection, is it, is it not? Through the chair, so the region has accountability over traffic signals through our agreement with the regional government. Um, so any, any traffic signals have to be approved by the region. Um, so we have been working with the region on this IP, IPX or PXO legislation <coughs> work. And um, this is the appropriate tool for this location. Um, it does give full right of way to the pedestrian. And um, you know, we'll continue to educate the community on, on rights and responsibilities at these crossings. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fernandez. Yeah, I just, um, on sort of a similar vein as Councillor Marsh, I know that this is the same kind of crossing that we have um, on Kingsway Drive, crossing from the apartments to, to the Fairview Park Mall. A route that I take probably four or five times a week. Um, and the number of times that I have, have either been suddenly had to stop 
very quickly because the person in front of me slams on their brakes. I don't know if the flashing beacon is enough. I think that the, the crosswalk sign that used to be up there com combined with the flashing beacon may actually be more. Have we considered doing a combination of those at this location? Mr. Cronkite? Through you, Madam Chair, so the PXL legislation that you see here, or what we're recommending here, replaces that old IPS structure that you're referring to. Um, they simply uh, don't exist in that same fashion anymore. So this is a replacement level to, to what you're referring to. Okay. And I understand that that's the intention. I, I guess I just don't know that if the sun is hitting the, the driver in a certain, certain way, you don't see those those flashing lights quite as clearly, and and that's my concern. Now I haven't assessed which way the sun is coming in with where this intersection is happening, but I know that it it has happened to me. Um, so I, I I'll be interested to see how uh, what the numbers are and the number of near misses, because I'm sure you'll hear about the near misses. Through you, Madam Chair. So the angle of the sun really shouldn't be an issue in this particular case, simply because. When you look at where the, lo the flashing beacons are located, um, they're located on top of the sign itself. So the sign itself is right in the driver's periphery. And because it's in the driver's periphery, um, you know, that the, the issue of the sun is, is negated at that point. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councillor Gazzola? I'm on seven, sir. Okay. Councillor Etherington? Yeah, I just had a quick question. If we see an increase in pedestrian crossing at this location because of the Drula project with 400 units nearby, would we revisit that crossing, that type of crossing? Through you, Madam Chair, the issue uh, isn't necessarily in respect to the volume of pedestrians. I would fully anticipate to see additional pedestrians from the Drulo development. It really is around the volume of traffic that's on the roadway. And the volume of traffic that's on the roadway in concert with the pedestrians uh, isn't warranting additional controls outside of what you see here. Uh, if we were to increase that pedestrian volume, I would anticipate that the, vo the, uh, the warrant would be very similar. Okay. And by the way, in Victoria Park, uh, many people are not using the buttons to stop traffic. Uh, but it's been my experience watching, especially the past weekend, is that traffic is stopping even when pedestrians ignore the buttons. They stop as soon as they see pedestrians. I've not seen any near misses at that location. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions for number six. Uh, it's been moved. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Uh, so number seven, the City Hall lease renewal for feelings from the Heart Wedding Chapel. Councillor Gazzola. Yeah, there are no, no details here. Is this the extension of a current lease? Uh, is it a new lease? If it's a new, uh, are there, uh, are the rates going up? And are there common area fees involved there? Ms. McOlter. So through you, Madam Chair, uh, this is a three-year lease renewal uh, with the same terms and um, monetary considerations as the previous lease. It does include um, the common area maintenance uh, fee in addition to a rent rate. So does the common area fee go up? Uh, the, all, all aspects of the lease agreement stays the same, so the common area maintenance remains the same as well. So there's no... Uh inflation uh, coverage for all of this? So that's correct. Um, so a third party assessment, realty assessment was performed um, in terms of market comparables. The assessment identified that um, the current uh, rent and uh, common area maintenance was consistent with comparables within the market. So, so if we didn't renew this, do they have the right for the three years Regardless, we, we don't have, is there a three-year extension that we don't have a, any rights to or? 
So through you, Madam Chair, my understanding and reading the lease agreement is that there is a renewal option um, whereby the um, tenant can initiate negotiation of the next um, uh, lease term. Um, and that was, I think, initiated six months in advance of the lease expiry. Okay, so these additional three years, does that then end the lease and a new lease is required? So my understanding uh, is at the end of each of the lease terms, there is a renegotiation process. It's unclear if the current tenant will be interested in continuing in that space past the three year. But they don't, under the current situation, they everything is frozen. I'm just, but that only goes along so long. Eventually there's a, there's a whole new lease. Uh, when, when does that happen? That's so through you, Madam Chair, um, the renegotiation of um, the lease, both the, well, the rent um, and evaluation of the, the common area maintenance uh, occurs at the end of every lease term. So that, that discussion um, and negotiation occurred in advance of us bringing forward this uh, new lease agreement or the lease agreement renewal for the three-year term. It's one, one final question. They have their own chapel in this leased area, correctly? Correct? They have a chapel there. Through you, Madam Chair, that's my understanding. Yeah. Do, uh, do they also use the, the, the chapel on, on the ground floor of the city hall? So through Mr. Dan Chapman, um, I understand that that chapel is no longer uh, oh. there. It's, it's no longer there? Well, what's, um, what's there now? <laughs> I want to touch with the reality. Mr. Chapman? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. For those that aren't familiar, there are two chapels. There's the one, the one that you're likely familiar with off the Young Street entrance that you can see through the glass doors into the wedding area. There was also one sort of in the bowels of City Hall on the main floor. Uh, that chapel was underutilized, very seldom used, uh, and it was removed as a part of the renovations that opened up that space for the SAP project team. You may recall that area was um, demolished, basically, and made into a common work area. I, I didn't remember that. Thank you. Okay, that's all the questions. It's been moved. Those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Okay, we're going to move on to item number eight, the 2018-19 school safety review. We're going to have a 10-minute presentation from Mr. Cronkite and Mr. McMillan, and then we have two delegations who are going to come forward, and then we'll have questions for staff. All right, so up first is Mr. Cronkite and Mr. McMillan. Through you, Madam Chair, we don't have a 10-minute presentation, <laughs> but we can give you a high-level overview uh, if you'd like. You can go ahead and give us whatever you... <laughs> if you don't even have a presentation, we don't have to go through it, but uh, I just that that's the note I had here. <laughs> so you don't need to... Oh, sorry. Through no, we'll uh, we'll defer to the delegates, and then okay. we'll just take questions after. Okay, sounds good. All right. Okay, with that, I'm calling forward Catherine and Mike. Please come to the microphone, and you have five minutes to make your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Lesko. I am a parent at Lackner Woods Public School and the current school council chair. I, along with Mike Hope, are also members of a subcommittee we have formed dedicated to the traffic issues surrounding our school. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Lackner Woods Traffic Committee members. In front of you, you should have um, a little package that we have made up for you. On the front is a visual of our school. If you'd like to turn to the next page, this shows the boundary map of our school. So if you look to the upper and right sides of the boundary, you will see some blank areas. These areas are designated for new build. 
These are mostly single-family homes, three to four bedrooms, and the expectation is that these will be occupied by young families who will then attend Lackner Woods. To the left of the school, which is that blue dot on your boundary map here, is a more established collection of homes. An internal school survey that we did within our Lackner Woods community showed that only 20% of these homes have families with children who walk to Lackner Woods, thereby leaving the remaining 80% of families coming from this opposite direction. <coughs> if you could turn just to your next one, it outlines what does our school look like. The student population of our school at the beginning of the 2017-18 year was 414 students. Heading into this school year for 2018-2019, our school population con continues to grow. To date, an additional 60 plus students have been enrolled. Two additional portables have been added to our school property after removing 10 at the end of 2016-17 school year. Internal school data indicated that of the 414 students in the 2017-18 year, 262 were potential walkers. If you compare that to the recent numbers from the staff traffic study, you will note that 94 pedestrians were counted. This is close to a quarter of our population and a third of our walkers. As a school community, we want to encourage more walkers. To do so, we need to support parents in trusting their children to arrive at school safely. Please turn to your next one. To date, our school council has worked with our parent community and has succeeded with the support of city and school board staff to do the following. We have been able to advocate for traffic calming on Zeller Drive, which resulted in the installation of the flexible delineator. We invited Colleen Cooper, who is, from the walking school bus, who is the walking school bus coordinator from the Canadian Cancer Society, to inform and help implement this initiative, which is the walking school bus. We were able to introduce an internal school survey to determine travel patterns and needs of our families, as well as barriers for families which prevent them from walking to school in the morning and after school. And also, we participated in the run, to run the Walk in Your Sneakers event, which the next two pages show the success of that. It's important to note that this uh, event also was done on rather short notice. So even with short notice, this was a well-attended event that took place on May 2nd of this year. Police and bylaw officers came out to support our students walking to school safely. The route they took was on the right of that map where we're looking to have the adult crossing guard. It was based on the number of students living in that area and the lack of established support. And if you look at these pictures, you'll see that there's a great collection of students coming all the way down the street. A continuation of this event happens on the next page. And please turn to the next that looks at the internal survey that we did within our school at Lackner Woods. By doing this research, we found the following. 90% of the parents that participated in this survey believe that traffic on Zeller Drive is the main area of concern around the school. 64% of children travel to school by walking. 84% felt that an adult crossing guard is the best option to pursue in getting our children to school safely. 73% that if there were safer procedures for their children to get to school, they would be more inclined to have them walk. 84% of current walkers travel from the area in which the adult crossing guard is recommended by staff, which is mid-block Zeller Drive. And the final, in conclusion, our school is 17 years young, and while we are growing, we want to grow with the times. The safety of our children is paramount, but so is their health. Only 14% of Canadian children between 5 and 11 meet the recommended minimum of 60 minutes of physical activity per day. This was cited from the Canadian Cancer Society. Now more than ever, we need to encourage healthy habits, which includes daily outdoor activity. Children who walk to school have been found to have higher academic performance, according to George Mammon, who is a researcher from the University of Toronto. We as a school community believe strongly in the health, both, both physically and mentally, of our students. An adult crossing guard gives parents the peace of mind that our children will have a safer route to school in a manner that enables them to begin their day being more alert. This, along with other benefits, help to promote a healthy and positive lifestyle. We thank staff for working with us to accomplish this goal and ask Council to endorse the recommendation for an adult crossing guard on Zelda Drive. Thank you very much for your presentation. And just so we're clear, you support what staff have recommended in the report? Yes, we are. Perfect. Great. Uh, Councillor Ioannidis, did you have questions of the delegation? 
I do, but uh, I originally ringed in for, question, uh, for questions of staff. Okay. But, uh, um, okay. Um, thank you for coming in, and uh, I'm glad that you guys came in, and this, this is an initiative that we're really supportive of. Uh, I guess my question would be, because Council uh, Chair Calloway Sealock, I was just wanted to reconfirm your support of the staff. But have you been involved with our with the the school travel planner coordinator? Yes. So Leslie Maxwell, I have met with her um, at the moment or at the beginning of the year. Her plate was rather full, so she gave us some support and some ideas of what to do. And it was those ideas that we followed through, which led us to get the flexible delineator, which connected us to Colleen Cooper from the Canadian Cancer Society. Okay, because yeah, that's that's the part I was getting at because I know. Um, the walking school bus was implemented in a school in the area that I represent. It's been really successful, so I just wanted to get that clarification because I think that's a really good program for, mm -hmm. that, for you guys to look at. We agree. Okay, thank you. All right, Councillor Fernandez. Thank you. Um, so as I'm looking at your boundary map, I just want to make sure I understand uh, because there's a couple of blue lines here. The one blue line um, sort of goes it doesn't look like it goes on a street, but that's because you're saying that there's more development happening in that area. That's right. right. So sort of that upper portion is undeveloped. Okay. And Zeller Drive is um, not quite two lanes, but pretty close to two lanes, isn't it? It's one. It's one, one each way. One each way there's at that point. There's a bike lane on each side, so it looks wider than it is. It, it, yeah, because it's I, 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 I'm familiar with that road. I know somebody who lives on that road, and it is. I thought it was wider than a one-lane road. Um, maybe it's just because of the, the on-street parking. Okay. When I look at the map, I, I, I absolutely support this idea because I think it's, if you want to get kids walking, you need to have parents buy in and feel that they're, they're, uh, they're safe. So when I look at your, the map in the report at 8-7, we already have a crossing guard at Ferry Crescent. Is that true? Do you... I'm unfamiliar with one at Fairway Crescent. I'm sorry. It says Fairway Crescent, but maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Maybe this is a question of staff as opposed to a question of you. So that's the Chicopee Hills um, boundary. So it's out of the Lackner Woods boundary. Okay. I'm sorry. I was looking at the incorrect map. Okay. Do we have a map for this one? I don't think so. I don't think no. we have a map for this one. Check. Okay. Okay. No, nope, that's fine. I'm. No, I'm okay. No, I, don't no. I don't need. I don't need. I'm familiar with what you're talking about, so I, I'm. I'm quite fine. At the appropriate time, I'll be happy to move this. Mayor Vervanovic. Thank you, and thank you very much for uh, for coming in today. Um, so, just to be clear, you're really just supporting the recommendation that's already in here. Mm -hmm. uh, in the report. And I, I would um, concur with this, and I know uh, uh, Dave, uh, Councillor Schneider would, uh, if, uh, if he were here uh, today as well. This is, uh, this is a, a busy street uh, at a very well attended school, um, and uh, it is something that would definitely benefit the, uh, the students, so uh, I'll certainly be supporting it. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions that we have for you. Thank you. Thank you. So in light of the fact that they're in favor of <laughs> the staff report, I know we're going to get further into um, the rest of the report, but if nobody else has questions or comments, uh, I'd like to, if everyone's okay, move forward with that specific recommendation, just that clause, so that they can be at peace and, and go home as opposed to <laughs> sit here through the next potentially some time uh, <laughs> while we deal with this. So if everyone's okay with that. So it's the, um, on the second page, 8-2, the second paragraph down, that an adult crossing guard assisted cro uh, school crossing be permanently established at the mid-block location on Zeller Drive in front of Lackner Woods Public School. So that's the only clause that we're dealing with right now. Those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. It does come back to council in two weeks' time, but as you see, the majority of, well, everybody actually here has supported it. So, Thank th thanks. Have a good night. Okay, so now we move back to questions of staff on the rest of the report. Councillor Ioannidis. Thank you, you Chair Galloway-Seelock. Just take one second. Just let staff 
get back. Okay, my, my question is relating to the school travel, travel planning initiative to be increased by 5,000. Can you just pull your mic a little bit closer? Sorry, That's my question is regards to the school funding, uh, I mean the funding for the school travel planning initiative. Um, I just want to know where that, that is at and uh, whether or not we're looking at increasing that, that role or adding additional staff in the future because of just a quick update because I'm not sure if, if the 5000 doesn't seem relatively a lot of money. Mr. Cronkite? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, the school travel planning funding is something that's split between the uh, City of Kitchener, the City of Waterloo, the City of Cambridge, and the school board as well. So uh, this increase in the total of, total of around $5,000 is really a recollection or a reflection, sorry, of the grant that the school travel planning program was awarded that is highlighted in the report. It uh, accommodates the ability to add additional staff and at the same time it will essentially double the number of schools that are reviewed in Kitchener on an annual basis. Okay, that, that's good. That's what I wanted to hear and uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, Councillor Yonetsky. In your recommendations, there's 14 recommendations here in this, in this report and um, and I know recommendation four talks about uh, the two locations being referred to the 2019 budget and, uh, and it's a cost. But notwithstanding that one, all the recommendations that are here before us, is it the objective to have them all implemented for the beginning of the school year starting in, uh, after Labor Day like next month? Or, or is there some delay for some of them? Uh, I'm not too sure. You know, they have their own little factors. but. Through you, Madam Chair, yes, that's the intent. Uh, part of the reason we're bringing it here now is so that we can, uh, our, our goal is to get every single one of these measures that are approved and installed prior to this school year. That, that's the intent. And will it happen? Assuming we approve this at council in two weeks? That is the intent, yes. Uh, to, to give you a guarantee is. <laughs> okay, thanks. Councillor Fernandez. Thanks. Um, so. I'm definitely a strong supporter of us making it safer and easier for kids to get to school. So to that end, um, I, I, I'd like to uh, be the mover on this, but I do have two questions for you. Um, one area that you're familiar with, uh, Apple Ridge and Dune Mills, um, has been an ongoing concern for citizens um, whose kids walk to JW Girth School. Uh, it's a three-way stop, and uh, we see very regularly uh, people who don't stop at three-way stops. So is there a plan to take a review of that specific area um, and maybe possibly other three-way stops that we have uh, in my ward around Brigadoon School? And additionally, so that's one question. And the second question is um, there is another, a, a lot more development that is occurring towards New Dundee Road, and so we're seeing an increase of volume coming down Dune Mills uh, and at, from the Robert Ferry area. Uh, I think maybe we should be also taking a review of that intersection as well. So what's the plan? Uh, I'm sorry, could you, what, what's the, the second component of that in terms the, of question? The, yeah, the, the second one is, yes, the second one is, is coming from the, the new Robert Ferry, Thomas Slee area. I know we've put in those flexi stakes on Thomas Slee and we've got some um, narrowings there as well, but there's a lot more development coming from uh, Blair Creek Street uh, and, a, and a couple of other streets in that area. So. I, any spot that we have a three-way stop, I'm wondering if maybe we should be looking at the volumes coming from those, through those areas. Okay. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I, your first issue specifically, Dune Mills Drive and Apple Ridge Drive. It's an intersection that we are uh, initially making changes to through the traffic calming review that was conducted for that street, uh, call it a couple of years ago now. We're in the process of installing those measures. At that intersection in particular, I will be installing a ladder crosswalk where the uh, children are intended to cross. So the intent there is to draw a little more attention to that area. It's, uh, it's, it blended in, or we felt that it blended into the background. It wasn't very clear that it was a, a school crosswalk. So we're trying to highlight it in that sense. 
Uh, within the report, uh, you'll see that staff have made reference to the uh, a, a new program called, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Dean, but it's the, um, yeah, so the exposure index. Uh, so what has happened from a crossing guard perspective is generally speaking, we were, we were bound to what is called gap studies. The new crossing guard uh, policy that was established at the OTM, uh, at the, the provincial level, allow, uh, has created a new type of study called an exposure index, which allows us to review uh, intersections and particular always stops specifically. So the intent is uh, to review the intersection of Dune Mills Drive and Apple Ridge Drive specifically in this new year to get an understanding of how that exposure index works. Uh, once we have a greater understanding of how that expo exposure index um, operates, then we'll be able to uh, potentially investigate some of those other, other intersections that you're referring to. Okay. And would that be something that we'd be looking at with the Robert Ferry extension connecting to Carindale? Because we will see a change in traffic patterns um, as that road moves forward. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, in terms of the Robert Ferry Drive, Carindale Drive area specifically, uh, you're likely referring to Brigadoon Public School. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we look at Brigadoon Public School specifically, any crossings related to that school would fall, fall under the old gap analysis process because there's really no, in terms of where you would expect to see pedestrians crossing, it's typically near the crest of the hill in that area. So uh, we wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be a good location for the new exposure index, but rather the old uh, gap study process. That being said, we would like to see, uh, or before we do any further reviews there, we would want to see Robert Ferry Drive extended to Carindale so that we could get a fuller picture of what the overall impact will be. Uh, that extension should be done relatively shortly, so we'll be able to review that location later on in the year. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Marsh. I am wondering about the school crossing guard guide that um, we are being asked to endorse the use of and I'm wondering uh, why we haven't received a copy of it. I'd like to, to, if we're going to be endorsing it, shouldn't we see that guide? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, we can provide a copy of the document to all of council. Okay. Thank you. And also, I am uh, glad to see a crossing guard being brought to Westmount Public School because I know they've had ongoing challenges. Um, and I'm wondering about the uh, implementation plan for the pedestrian crossover level two type D um, on Walter Street behind King Edward. Is this going to be a, uh, uh, when is the implementation planned? Through you, Madam Chair, because there's no um, underground infrastructure required for a type D facility, it's simply signs and pavement markings. Our anticipation is that we should be able to get that in prior to the new school year. Okay, that's great. So are we, um, Going to, so what I'd like to also understand is um, whether or not there's uh, any kind of annual thanking of the crossing guards. Uh, we they are part of our staff, I realize, but I just uh, and so there's general staff appreciation. But I'm just wondering, uh, these these crossing guards put their lives at risk on a daily basis, and they are. Often they make the, the difference at the beginning and the end of the day for many of these students, and I'm just wondering um, to what degree we are able to, to thank the, uh, these staff members. Sir, there you go. Through, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, I agree. Um, uh, the uh, crossing guards need to be recognized. I'm dealing with them day in and day out, and um, I like when I hear from the public or from the guards, um, recognizing any work that they do. But actually upcoming, we have our annual crossing guard meeting, which is toward the end of August. And that's where I have everyone together and we uh, have to review mandatory training anyway, but it's a chance for us to recognize anyone that's gone above and beyond throughout the year and recognize retirements and so on and so forth. So 
we have little things um, such as that along the way during the course of the school year. That's great to hear. And I think, and, and so also I just wanted to understand whether or not uh, this, by, by endorsing this recommendation, are we excluding the possibility of responding to emerging needs as they become apparent in the upcoming school year? Are we, uh, is this going to close the door on potential new crossing guard locations? Go ahead, Mr. Cronkite. Through you, Madam Chair, no, absolutely not. This is really a rec this is a recognition of the known issues that we've had, uh, call it to date, and so we plan to address these immediately. However, should uh, just like a typical process, should um, issues arrive midstream in a school year, we'll absolutely take a look at those and address them accordingly. Okay, thank you, Councillor Etherington. Through you, Madam Chair, to Mr. Cronkite. Uh, Mr. Cronkite, could you explain to me the difference between this crossing and the one on Cameron King? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, could you clarify which crossing it is that you're referring to? I'm sorry, the crossing uh, King Edward School on Walter Street in my ward. Yes, uh, through you, Madam Chair. The crossing on Walter Street is a very unique issue in that uh, you have the school on one side of Walter Street and then you have the playground on the opposite side. So there's a daily interaction of school-age pedestrians back and, forth, uh, back and forth across that road uh, a handful of times, for sure. It's their area that they go for recess and outdoor gym and, and the like. In terms of... Uh, the crossing at King and Cameron, uh, the biggest difference is the age of the pedestrians that we would anticipate using the crossing. Um, Cameron Heights is obviously a secondary school, older, older children, uh, whereas Walter Street is an elementary school. Okay. And I'm glad to see that crossing going in on Walter Street. Thank you. Okay, there's uh, no more questions from the committee. I have just a couple. Um, first, I want to go to um, paragraph one, two, three, four, five. It's the 40 kilometer zone for the new Janet Metcalf School. Um, I was wondering if we could extend that, that um, clause and include Loopold Street from Seabrook to Olivia. If you go to the map on 8-9, it's the top part there, Ludolf, and it, it's those first two streets right where the park, where Hewitt Park is, because I think that um, a good portion of the students are gonna be coming from that direction. Through you, Madam Chair, we can investigate that. One of the okay. reasons that we've precluded that area specifically is consistency. So. Uh, what we've done in the past is make these areas around school frontages 40 kilometers an hour, and this would be outside of that school frontage. Yeah. I just, with the way that the park is established, um, ev like everyone who's coming from that direction is going to walk through the park versus going around to the school, right? So um, there'll be a lot of pedestrian traffic there. So if you could investigate that, that would be good. Absolutely. We'll take a look at it. Okay, and the other question I have is with respect to a crossing guard at Fisher Holman and Seabrook. Um, it's at the roundabout there. Uh, the kids who typically would have gone to Jean Steckley School are now going to be going to Janet Metcalf, just the sevens and eights. Uh, and there's some serious concern with people crossing at the roundabout there. Um, so I just was wondering if that had been given thought or if we can look into uh, getting a crossing guard at that location. Through you, Madam Chair, we will connect with the region on, on this issue. Uh, the one thing that we need to highlight is that while um, the safety of children is obviously a municipal issue, uh, Fisher Holman is a regional road and the operation of that roundabout uh, falls within regional jurisdiction. So uh, we will need to connect with the region and get their take on whether or not a, a crossing guard would be warranted there. If that's the case, if the region supports a crossing guard, we'll also have a conversation about funding of that guard. Okay. 
One of my concerns is that um, there's already been a utility worker that was there that um, through the winter months was, um, was killed by a car and so um, I think it's important that roundabout is uh, definitely a dangerous area and uh, there's a lot of slippery pieces uh, in that roundabout especially at winter so if we now add even more pedestrians I'm seriously concerned um, about that. I understand it's region but uh, anything we can do to help that I know there's a lot of parents who are hoping that we can get a crossing guard there. Mr. Reedman, did you have something to add? Yeah, through the chair, I would like to add about the follow-up on uh, the speed limit in front of the school frontage. So on our business plan for this year, um, we have included looking at citywide speed limits. So I think the, the best way to look at that, along with other similar type schools, is to roll it into that overall program. Just because this is a new school, I would I would respectfully ask that you may be able to look at that before the school year starts, just so that it's established with the school because it's brand new. Like the school is only opening this year, but I'll, I'll give you guys to council to have that discussion and see what uh, suits best. Um, okay, that's yeah, that's all my questions. Yeah, Councillor Davies first, Councillor Davies. Thank you. Just on the on the portion about regional roads, I think this is probably the appropriate time to ask. Uh, there was an accident uh, with the crossing guard at, uh, at Bridgeport School. Is, do we have an automatic review process, and did anything come out of that? If there was, did anything come out of that process to improve the safety? Through you, Madam Chair, I'm unaware of the um, the collision. Are you are you speaking of a collision with a crossing guard? Yes. Uh, when on Bridgeport? When was that? Where was that? No, uh, timing. Uh, it was just recent. Uh, West oh, was it Westmount? Yeah. Oh. oh, okay. My 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 mistake. Pardon me. Um, but just as yeah, as an anecdote, I have heard actually some concerns about the crossing at Bridal Trail and Bridge as well. But I'll follow up with you at a later date. Okay. So the, there's still the question, though. Is there an automatic? What was your question? automatic review when there's the collision. Mr. Cronkite? Through you, Madam Chair, there's not necessarily an automatic review, but when there is a, a collision, especially considering what happened on Westmount, we, we typically will review it automatically ourselves. Uh, there's no outstanding policy that uh, dictates that, but best practices would indicate there would, rec you know, would dictate that for us personally. I think Mr. Even has something to add to that. Uh, through the chair, so anytime there is an injury with a, a staff employee, um, there's health, health and safety protocols that go into place, so um, this does fall within that legislation, so there was a review through that. Okay. Uh, Councillor Marsh. I did remember another question. I'm just wondering if staff intends to go ahead with implementing a lot of these changes in their planning and uh, putting the hiring and putting in the signs or if we need to uh, consider uh, approving this at special council uh, in order for them to be able to have the time to do that before the school year begins. Mr. Cronkite. Through you, Madam Chair, I don't think that it would be necessary to recommend that you do this through special council. Uh, presuming there is support at the committee level, we can start doing a lot of the background work now. Uh, and so, you know, within the next couple of weeks, we can have everything set and ready to go. For example, we can, uh, we can put the application in for locates and, and whatnot now. And uh, as long as everything goes well at council in two weeks, then we'll be ready to go. Okay, thanks. Councillor Unetsky? Uh, yeah, now is a good time to start comments. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm su support to all the recommendations here before us. I think they're uh, a good step forward. Uh, I know one of the recommendations pertains to Westmount Public School that we've already implemented, and just a matter of following up with the paperwork here. So, and I know there's issues there with other uh, wards and other schools in, uh, uh, in the area as well, and increasing the crossing guards, I think it's quite important. And of course, we're always trying to get um, students to, uh, to walk to school and uh, make it easier. It avoids 
The other problem that we have is where parents drive them to school and then becomes the parking issue near uh, schools and you have no parking permitted and everybody's trying to drop them off or pick them up in the afternoon and that's another issue. So if we can encourage more uh, walking, that's, that's wonderful. And by having the crossing guards there, that's a sort of a step in the right direction. So uh, I'm in agreement with all the recommendations here. It's a good step forward. I actually have one more question from me. Um, I forgot about this. I know last year um, some of our crossing locations didn't have crossing guards at the beginning of the year, not because they weren't warranted, but because we didn't have um, enough crossing guards. Is that still an issue that we have? Um, or how are we handling making sure we have enough crossing guards to cover all locations? For you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, last year was my first year as the supervisor of crossing guards and we did have some people that left um, immediately before the school year. This year I have um, taken some actions to ensure that that doesn't happen. Now with that being said, um, some people, it is the type of job where some people leave um, without very much notice and it can be difficult to find new hires since it's only a part-time position that works a couple of hours per day outside. So, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, with my discussions with other municipalities within the area, it's um, an ongoing concern. but. Um, we have taken different steps. Um, I've, I've asked some of the more senior guards um, to help me enlist new guards. So I'm hoping this year will look a little bit better than last year. Okay. So it was a little bit of an anomaly and just timing issue maybe last year. Okay. Thank, uh, thank, thank you. Okay. There's, uh, I don't see anybody else who wants to make comments. So uh, it's been moved. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you very much for that report. So now we will move on to number nine, the LED streetlight conversion. I don't believe there's any presentation. I believe it's just questions if anybody has any. Councilor Davey. Thank you. Uh, yeah, a couple questions. Uh, first off, this, this, is, this is certainly some good news in terms of the, the financing and funding. Um, but my question is, it, it says on the page 9-2 that the uh, payback period has been reduced uh, from eight years to five and a half years. It's not really clear how that translates to the tables, but I'm just wondering, does this mean in, I guess, we're a bit, of, a bit into it, does this mean like four years time or so we're going to have a positive variance on our budget going forward? Go ahead. Through the chair, yes, by 2022, we expect that the project would be completely paid back. And when council originally approved this, they approved half of those savings once the project was paid back to go into a reserve for the replacement of the LED system. Okay. Uh, so half the savings go into that, half the savings would be available for other means. Okay, do you know how much that is offhand? The uh, yeah, in the ballpark of a half a million dollars. Okay, so 250 to reserves and 250 to whatever council of the day decides to do. No, it, it's 500 and 500. Oh, better yet, very good. Okay, um, question on the, it's a little bit unclear. I understand that Silver Springs is now iTron, which is fine, they're a public company, but is the licensing agreement with them or this Fairway Electric? company. Go ahead. Uh, through the chair, the agreement is with Fairway Electrical. Um, they have agreed to be uh, Silver Springs operations north of the border. Oh, sorry, iTron Inc. So iTron Inc. is an American company. They don't have operations set up in Canada, uh, but Fairway Electrical has now taken on that role. So they've formed um, a partnership amongst themselves. Okay, so I, I noticed that Fairway is, they're, they're privately held. So my only concern is, have we done some risk management in terms of what happens if this company were to disappear? What happens to our data? Are we doing backups? So the data is hosted with iTron Inc. Um, iTron Inc. is a very large international company. Um, and we have stipulations in the contract that our data would be secure 
uh, for I believe 30 days and we would have 30 days to retrieve that data um, at any point if the contract was terminated for whatever reason. Okay, very good. Uh, my other question is the cost recovery from the region. It reads as though, again, I'm not sure this is approved by the region or not, but it reads, it reads as though the region may have an interest in using uh, the network specifically within Kitchener because none of the other municipalities have it. And I'm just curious if what their interest would be in just if it's only Kitchener and they can't apply it elsewhere. So those are for the lights through the chair. Those are for the lights that the region owns that are within the Kitchener boundary. Um, so we, our network is for all lights within the city of Kitchener and those lights fall within that boundary. So the region um, at the time of procurement and when this project was being planned decided to include their lights on the network. Um, I think Mr. Cronkite wants to add something. Yeah. Through you, Madam Chair, similar to the way that we've structured the, uh, the adaptive control network to basically be able to do pilots for smart city initiatives and potentially bring smart city initiatives on stream, uh, the region has a similar uh, desire to do, uh, for example, intelligent transportation systems, ITS. So um, them partnering, partnering with us uh, is, a, is an opportunity for them to test smart systems here in Kitchener itself and then potentially roll that out to uh, the municipalities and the townships uh, once they have uh, a, a similar network up and running. Okay, I, th I was curious because they don't have the network currently. I uh, know that's good. Um, and the only la the last question I have is it all I also noticed that we're allowed to, as part of this agreement, we're allowed to sort of, I don't know, um, sublet the service, it seems like. Um, last I heard, I believe the city of Guelph was also looking at a very similar, I think it was actually Silver Spring, uh, the exact same network. Have we had any discussions with them in terms of an economy of scale going forward? Uh, through the chair, not with the city of Guelph, um, but we, uh, through verbal discussion with area municipalities, um, we understand that there is interest because of the success we've had here at the city of Kitchener uh, to potentially leverage this same system um, for their own future smart city initiatives. Um, if they choose to do so, like you said, we have um, included that permission in our contract to um, allow them to access our system for a fee that we decide on with the municipality. Okay, so we don't have to name any names, but basically you're saying there's potential for other local municipalities to go back and add them after the fact, the smart controls. That's correct. Okay, very good. I would actually ask then, I'm happy to move this, um, I would ask actually that we do engage with Guelph because uh, I did inquire on my own and it sounds like they're implementing the exact same system and they're actually not promoting it in an IOT way that I think they, they should be. Uh, so perhaps they're unaware of the potential of it, so it might be a good, good line of communication. Councillor Fernandez. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> through the line of questioning from Councillor Davy, I'm wondering if my question is, is related to the whole fact that are we one of the first uh, and early adoptees of this, this new program? Through the chair, um, yeah, the city of Kitchener is certainly a pioneer when it comes to smart city networks, specifically for streetlights. Um, we do have another Canadian case study, um, that's Halifax, who have entered into a very similar agreement with the, the same vendor uh, being ITRON. So Halifax is doing the same test program as what we're doing. Is that, that's what I'm, is that what I'm understanding from your answer? Uh, th through the chair, I, I wouldn't call it a test program. Um, they've implemented, uh, they converted 43,000 streetlights um, with control nodes on an adaptive network. Um, so the, similar to ours, those are all connected and are, they can control and monitor, the, monitor those streetlights similar to how we can. Okay. Uh, Mr. Cronkite, did you want to add something? Through you, Madam Chair, I wouldn't say that we were a pioneer. Uh, we might be a pioneer in Canada, but in terms of um, these types of mesh networks, they're very popular throughout North America and, and elsewhere in Europe. Uh, to give you a, a kind of a one really good example, Florida Power has a roughly 500,000 streetlights that they've networked very similar to what we have already done. Uh, it, it's proven very successful elsewhere. Uh, it's just, uh, again, as Aaron mentioned, ITRON, or formerly Silver Spring, doesn't have a strong foothold in Canada to this point yet. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, it's good to know that, that this program is, is elsewhere um, because I think I'm a little bit, I would be a little bit concerned 
about the data and where where is this data going to be going to be housed um, so that would lead to my question about what kind of data are we collecting um, you said that we would be, uh, if something happened, we would have 30 days to withdraw that data from um, ITRON. Is that enough time? Yeah, th th there, through the chair, there is a lot of data that these streetlights generate. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's only reasonable to ask ITRON to keep that data um, for so long. Um, but we're going to be setting up a process internally that we're retrieving that data um, on an ongoing basis, um, likely monthly or biweekly. Uh, the data is hosted in the United States. I believe it's Las Vegas, um, but there's no personal information. It's all streetlight data, um, mainly around how much energy those streetlights are using and how well they're functioning um, and troubleshooting data, but n no personal information. Yeah, I, I, and that was in the report, and I, I, I take some comfort in that because I think um, people generally would feel a little uncomfortable if there was personal data being collected. Can we just, uh, can you give me a couple of examples, so you did kind of give me some examples already in your answer when you said the energy that it's, that it's generating, troubleshooting, um, is there other data that's being collected, for example, um, park, cars parking, uh, garbage collection, snow removal, is any of that being collected as yet or is that anticipated to be collected? Through the chair, uh, the, the sensors that we have, the nodes, are only for streetlight data. Um, so the, the examples that I gave you, that's the limitations of the data we're collecting now, but through other smart city initiatives, um, such as traffic or weather monitoring or gas and water meter, um, in, we, in the agreement we have the uh, permission to use the same rate of 34 cents per connected node and apply that to any smart city initiative that the city decides to take on over the next 10 years. And would that be an additional cost? It, it comes at a cost of 34 cents per connected node. Out of 34 cents. Yeah. Okay. In the report, it talks about um, that staff has had to maintain and upgrade the premise software and associated hardware. Um, so does this mean that we'll have uh, additional time savings and will those staff people be reallocated to other responsibilities maybe related to this program? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, we did not actually implement uh, the software on-premise. So uh, we would have had to figure out how are we going to manage and maintain and install the system if, if it were to, to be installed on-prem. So uh, it's, it's on the cloud, so the vendor is going to manage it. So there is no change in the amount of work that staff will have to do for this. Okay. That's great. Okay. Thank you very much. Councillor Gazzola. My first uh, question is, is it possible to just get an update on the budget for this whole project just to see where we stand? We had a, we had a, we were looking at an eight year payback. Now we're looking at five and a half years. Can we just get a sort of a refreshed summary of where we're at? Through the chair, the uh, original I mean, you don't have to do it now. Can, can I can do it orally now. If you... <laughs> okay, I was going to ask that you, <laughs> if you could provide us with a, with a little uh, uh, oh, ch chart. chart. Yes. Yeah, so okay. Yeah. That's fine. So that we can, for next week, before it comes back to council. Sure. Yeah. The, uh, thank you. Uh, the, the, uh, this program has been in place now. Have we used any of these nodes and... 2018, all these nodes that we've added? Through the chair, yes. Um, each node on each street light, we have 15,000 street lights each equipped with a node. Uh, we use them on a daily basis. Have you, uh, are you able at this point, well there's, there's over half a, they've, there, they've been there for at least a half a year if not longer, are you able to uh, give us some information as to what you've been able to do because of them? Uh, sure. Uh, so our uh, street light maintenance provider is KW Hydro, and w they're responsible for uh, maintaining and fixing our lights. Uh, with SLV, that's street light vision, 
uh, we can log on to that and um, troubleshoot any problems that are flagged on the system and let KW Hydro know what the issue is, whether it's a blown fuse, if it's a power supply issue, or if it's an issue with the communication node or the lamp itself. And if it's an issue with the lamp or the communication node, that's under warranty. So we can contact Fairway Electrical to come out and uh, fix that under warranty versus sending two trucks for two different trips each to inspect. Um, so that's one way that we use it on an ongoing basis. Um, okay, no, you, no, that's fine. Yeah. I don't, I, you don't need to go through it. I just wanted to know if we are, we're told that we can do all of these things so we actually are using them. Yeah, and yeah. another thing I should flag is we've dimmed all the lights in the city um, using the adaptive that, network. That's what I wonder. You yeah. have done that. Yeah, we've dimmed um, the lights by either 23% or 15%, depending if they're located on a collector road or a local road. Now, do you control, I, I gather these regional lights are on regional roads or are those our lights? They're on regional roads owned by the region. Th those 3,200 lights, are those uh, of the region, are they, uh, you, you control all of those? Uh, no, through SLV, that's Streetlight Vision, um, different permissions can be set up. So we can't see or monitor the region's lights, and the region cannot see or monitor the city-owned lights. So you each look after your own. Can, that's correct. Yeah, okay. The, uh, now the other thing, the only thing that, that these nodes do now are controlling doing issues with the lights. And I, you might have already answered it. If we go to start doing other things, we're looking at another node, or does uh, is that what happens? Yeah, through the chair, that, that's correct. So, so the, the sensors and the nodes are specific to control and monitor the street lights, and they sit on each street light on the top. If we wanted to monitor parking or weather or gas meters, th those would require their own sensors, but we can use the adaptive network infrastructure that we've installed to communicate all that data and information back um, to the, through the network into SLV in some cases. So right now we have 15 plus, 15 plus thousand nodes. We get into uh, meter reading. We're gonna have to add another 15,000 nodes. Go ahead. Uh, no, so uh, if we were to do smart metering, for example, the smart meters would themselves need to be installed, but they would communicate to one of the nodes on the street lights and transfer that data back to City Hall or the data center. So they would communicate with the existing Correct. nodes. Correct. So we're now running into another 34 cents a month. Correct. Okay. And so the nodes we, you'd say the nodes we have now will, will do everything. Is that what so the, uh, through you, Madam Chair, the, the nodes are what we call as narrowband, so they are not broadband, so they cannot be used, for example, Wi-Fi, they cannot be used for uh, video applications, but they can be used for uh, applications that use less bandwidth, like smart parking is an example, smart water meter reading is an example, smart garbage is an example, so there are, there are, tip, there are applications that this can be used for and some it cannot be. Okay, that, that's what it gives us. I think Mr. Cronkite want, just wants to add something. Through you, Madam Chair, the easiest way to, because it took me a while to wrap my head around these things as well, because it's, it's technology that I wasn't familiar with. So the easiest way to think about it is the 15,000 nodes that we have there are really a communications blanket. So if we were to, for example, do smart parking, as Chayton had alluded to, uh, we would need to add a node, a single node, be it a video camera or be it a sensor within the roadway that would then communicate uh, to that communication blanket that our current system has provided and then that would communicate. So uh, taking a, uh, a video camera as an example that uh, would monitor a parking lot, that would be one singular node, so we would add 34 cents. Okay, that, that's, that's the point. You, to do that, you would just be adding a node for that parking lot. We're not adding 15,000 nodes. So the, but I gather if we did get into, and it's something I've been interested in, is, is meter reading. Meter reading covers the whole city. Does that mean we have to add 15,000 nodes? 
Through you, Madam Chair, no, we don't need to add 15,000 more nodes. The technology would be built into the meter itself. So that meter okay. uh, would communicate to the existing nodes. Okay, so you did say that, yeah. So in that case, all right. I just was uh, concerned about this. It's 34 cents, they add up to three, three quarters of a million dollars. So that's fine, thank you. And I would appreciate if, uh, uh, you know, it looks like everything's going in the right direction, even better than we expected to, just to get an update on, on, on where it looks and where we're going. So, thank you. Councillor Davey? Yes, sir, thank you. I just need a bit of clarification based on, I think it got better near the end, but my understanding is we don't have to pay for anything as long as, as if the sensor is uploading to an existing node, we don't have to pay for whatever, the, well, we have to pay for the device, we don't have to pay a licensing fee for every single water, water meter device that sends up, or if it's a parking, if, if there's a parking, if we want to track parking, for example, that's within the range of vision of a street light, for example, we wouldn't have to pay for a new node to monitor that specific camera that's going over that. It's only if we add it to new street lights to expand the network. Through you, Madam Chair. So in that sense, if we were adding, again, if we were adding a video camera as an example to record the lot, it would be, that's considered a sensor, it'd be one, uh, one cost. It would be that 34 cents. So it is an, an additive process. Uh, if you think about um, each location as a node, it, uh, it is an add-on. Um, but again, the, the, the meter reading notwithstanding, it's a very minimal cost in terms of adding uh, potential smart city infrastructure. Mr. Reedman would like to add something. Okay, uh, through you. the chair, so maybe I can clarify a little bit further. So the mesh network is a network across the whole city. We're paying a fee right now to host data. So if we were adding something like um, meter readings, like we may use our network to transmit the data, but we may decide to house that data in-house. Um, so those types of sensors would be different than the ones that we're using to house data off-site, if that helps clarify things. So sorry, because we're housing our streetlight data off-site, we are paying a fee to manage our software for that component. Um, but adding additional sensors may not follow that additional fee. It just depends on how, if we're following a software of, as a service model for those additional features or not. Okay, so again, just I want to make sure I understand, but so why couldn't we just pay, like why wouldn't the licensing model just be pure data driven? Like why wouldn't they just charge us so much per trans Emitted data or maximum amount of storage space, et cetera. I just, I just don't understand. Like, I guess I'm applying it to like to Wi-Fi. It should be essentially a Wi-Fi signal. I don't pay to send a Wi-Fi signal from my phone to the network, specifically for each individual device. If you have a Wi-Fi, so why would I be, why would we be paying to send from each individual sensor to a network that we already own? That's the part that I'm having trouble with. Mr. Chapman would like to weigh in. Through Madam Chair, I think, I think staff are saying very similar things, but they don't sound identical. And so perhaps between now and in two weeks' time, we can prepare a memo that will outline how nodes relate to sensors and where we'll have additional cost and where we won't. I understand the question you're answering. I don't think we're doing a good job to answer it here today. And so if you give us two weeks, we'll put it in writing and respond. Okay, it is, it is important because what I don't want to see is I don't want to see an additional, you know, 40 cent charge in every single device that we're adding throughout the city. And I'm not hearing that exactly, but there's, there's some clarity there. So we can get that before council meeting. I'd very much appreciate it. Uh, sorry, one other quick question. Um, is part of this licensing model, I understand the Streetlight Vision was one version of software and Silver Springs at the time was working on a more comprehensive IoT software. Do we get to upgrade to that for free once that becomes, once that's developed? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, yes, uh, the, uh, the, that, that is one of the reasons why we switched to the uh, cloud model for the state light vision software. The vendor, or iTron, said we are not going to develop the on-prem version of the state light vision software anymore. So if you want new features and if you want future IoT capability built into the software, then we recommend that you move to the uh, cloud model. Okay, but that's included in the 10-year? The Correct. Very good, thank you. Just, just to add to that, the 34 cents per node um, includes ongoing up, up, updated access to software. So we're always gonna have the latest software and that's part of what that 34 cents covers, including all the data, retention, and management. Clear, it's all done. <laughs> that's all the questions. Uh, it's been moved. Uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to make any comments. Uh, not seeing any. Uh, it's been moved. All in favor? Opposed. That's carried.
And with that, we are all done community infrastructure services. Thanks, everyone.